Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fisigan from Central New Mexico Community College continuing our discussion on the blood. In video E, we discussed hemostasis where we learned how after a, uh, an injury our blood stops flowing due to the process of hemostasis. But now we need to take a look at what needs to happen in order to get rid of the clot that was formed during the third phase of hemostasis, namely coagulation. So relatively shortly after a clot has formed, after hemostasis has occurred, in less than an hour, we're beginning to see that clot retraction as well as repair starts to um, occur. And this again depends on platelets and some other things. The platelets contain, as I mentioned before, actin and myosin, which allows them to contract. And as they do that, um, they are also going to help with pulling the edges of the blood vessels together even more so um, than what was happening during the vascular phase. Now, as the blood vessels are being squeezed together, or the ends, I should say, then we also see that serum gets squeezed out of the blood, which is really just plasma without clotting factors. And all in all, this all reduces the size of our damaged area. So there we have clot retraction. At the same time, we see repair kicking in by mitotic divisions of our smooth muscle cells, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, basically the various cells that were damaged. And once again, the platelets granules that are filled with all kinds of chemicals play a role. This time the chemical is platelet derived growth factor PDGF that allows for these mitotic divisions to occur. Finally after a few days we need to literally lyse that clot which we refer to as fibrinolysis, the dissolving of the clot. Now inside of the clot is a inactive enzyme called plasminogen. It collects inside of that clot. Plasminogen is a protein that flows around in the blood and it gets trapped inside of the clot and eventually it will be converted to plasmin. And plasmin is what's going to allow for that clot to dissolve. Now we need a very very important activator or activating enzyme for this reaction to occur. It's abbreviated TPA and you will hear about TPA a lot in your health profession. It stands for tissue plasminogen activator, literally meaning the enzyme that activates plasminogen. Why is this so important clinically? Because this is the catalyzing enzyme for this reaction such that clots can dissolve. Therefore, this is often given to patients who are suspected to be suffering from a heart attack due to clotting in their coronary vessels. So we provide patients with TVA, TPA, I'm sorry, to dissolve clots um, and try to save their lives. Now there are other components uh, required for this reaction, particularly thrombin and even some other clotting factors. But you should definitely be aware of the fact that without TPA, the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin and thrombin cannot occur. Um, TPA is crucial with the production of plasmin in order to literally dissolve clots. So, so far we've looked at the three phases of hemostasis. Then we've looked at what happens after hemostasis, as in the, the reduction of the size of the wound, the, the repair of the cells that were damaged, and of course, finally, the lysis of the clot itself. What we still need to take a look at is what can regulate coagulation. It's very important for it to be regulated because clearly, we don't want too little coagulation, but also not too much. We don't want coagulation to occur when there aren't any wounds. 
in the body, whether they are internal or external wounds. Uh, but at the same time, we also don't want uh, coagulation to continue endlessly at the site of an injury. So there needs to come a point in time where this whole positive feedback mechanism of hemostasis and particularly coagulation stops. So let's first of all look at factors that stimulate the process of coagulation. And of course, the, all of those clotting factors themselves act as positive feedback um, systems, but especially thrombin. As a matter of fact, thrombin can um, feed back to both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway and keep those pathways going. So this whole system is one after the other, uh, a form of positive feedback. But then we also have inhibiting factors. Like I said, if there isn't any injury, we do not want coagulation to occur. Or if there is an injury, we don't want coagulation to continue endlessly. So in our blood, we actually have anticoagulants that um, are going to always fight off the actions of the coagulants. The flowing blood itself is going to make it harder to coagulate. And then we also see that there are things that can make it harder for our platelets to, to stick. For one, the endothelium is smooth in, in blood vessels that are not damaged and assuming that they're healthy blood vessels that are not full of plaque. You can see that the buildup of plaque could initiate hemostasis. Um, we also see that endothelial cells release nitric oxide, which is a good vasodilator. And then finally, there's something called PGI2, which is better written as PGI2, um, which stands for platelet growth inhibiting. Finally, our diet, as we've mentioned before, needs to contain calcium as well as vitamin K. And vitamin K, by the way, if we ingest it with our food, we must um, also have access to fats because without fats, the vitamin K cannot be absorbed in um, our intestines. I mentioned anticoagulants present in our blood uh, before, and they're present in higher amounts than coagulants. Let's list a few of the more important anticoagulants, and these are the ones I'd like for you to be aware of. There are many more, by the way. Fibrin itself can be considered an anticoagulant, if you think about it. Uh, heparin, which is produced by basophils and even other cells called mast cells, including endothelial cells, heparin being a blood thinner. The liver produces something called protein C, uh, which you'll often see appear on patients' blood reports as well. It, um, it can inhibit the intrinsic pathway from occurring. Antithrombin 3, which floats around in the plasma, um, can inactivate thrombin. And then finally, drugs such as aspirin and coumadin, a form of warfarin, are good anticoagulants. Aspirin is blocking or inhibits thromboxin, thromboxane A2, which is one of those platelet uh, chemicals, making it difficult for the whole process of hemostasis to occur. And then coumadin antagonizes the recycling of vitamin K, which therefore um, makes it difficult for us to have a good supply, a constant supply of active vitamin K in the body. This then is the end of not just hemostasis, this, but also the steps that occur after hemostasis and some of the regulatory mechanisms involved in coagulation.